Credibility is interesting here because cartographers have to just accumulate information. And one thing that's important in any map you look at for your work is has the cartographer been to all these places or have they asked other people about it? Where have they gotten the information that they're trying to show you, right? This is really important. And very quickly going through, if we look at a map, say, of 1644 of Africa, we see the outline of Africa looking quite, quite clear. But we also know that the interior is full of all kinds of lines and squiggles that, at least from a Western perspective, was not known. No one had been there, right? So this European map of Africa is using quite consistent outline provided by various sailors, navigators, and explorers, so it looks good. But the inside is actually quite fanciful information taken usually from Ptolemy and other mythology in Europe. Because no one from Europe had visited there to do that. 1644. If we ratchet ahead quickly to the Enlightenment, we see the preoccupation with only using verifiable knowledge, and we see an empty middle. It's got to be blank, right? And zooming in just to Central Africa here, just zooming I'll back up, I'll just zoom in just to this bit, because I just wanted to show you one thing about credibility. You know, you can see how it becomes blank. There is a big lake there, and I'm going to look at what it says at the top of that lake on the right-hand side. This lake is said to extend farther and broader to the north. In other words, Danvi, when he made this map, is telling us, and that was a copy by Broughton, that's not really important. Danvi is telling us, well, I have put this lake on there because enough people have told me. And I believe them that it's there, although we don't, I don't really know. But it's said to do that and leaves it in hash marks. Likewise, on this map of the same lake, Lake Malawi, in the northern parts of the lake, um, we can see some interesting writing here. They were exploring the lake. This is the farthest part they went by the land party, farthest point reached by boat. So they never went to the north end of the lake. They were wondering if there was a river there. So on the top, we see river said to enter here from a marsh. What happened was we read their diaries and journals and all these things, which I spent about three years doing. We find out that they spent all their time talking with local African leaders, fishermen, and other things to figure out what the geography of this lake was. And what's actually here is African cartography at the top of this map being reflected in a European way. And what's exposed here is all kinds of issues about who is a credible reporter of geography and who is not a credible reporter of geography. And I was able to tease all this out and write chapters and chapters on this little bitty end of the map at the top. So maps can persuade people about various things. I just wanted to show some other persuasive maps here trying to show us things. Maybe more politics. Cold War map of the Soviet Union published in the United States, right? <laughs> Two worlds exist, the blue one and the red one. It's like, it sounds like a Marvel movie, doesn't it? Marvel superhero movie. And look at those great lines beaming out, that threat of the Soviet Union, right? That's good choices being made there. Complete opposite by the French, by the Communist Party in France, similar era. Who's the aggressor here if America has all these bases surrounding the Soviet Union, right? These are all American bases with arrows then pointing towards the USSR and China, right? Other persuasions used in maps. Argentina. Here's the Republic of Argentina with these little islands included. Ooh. But we all know they're actually the Falklands, right? But on an Argentinian map, they might look different. Or this map, mm -hmm. who's the aggressor nation? Here's the German Empire in 1940. Here's the British. This is from a German propaganda piece, written in an English magazine, English language magazine published in Germany in 1940 called Facts in Review. Yeah. Or this map of San Diego, California, comparing different districts in the city, their life expectancy to various countries around the world and their life expectancy. Yeah, see? So if you live in this district, your life expectancy is similar to that in Australia. If here, it's more like Hungary. Up there, you know, more like Jamaica or Sweden, depending where you live. Trying to make a point about the relationship between national in income and health indicators around the world. Or what about max populations, politics, and power? Some other choices here. Just going to zip through these very quickly. You know, you see a regular world map down there in the left-hand corner, but if we do it by 
population size and inflate the countries according to their population, we see a different map of the world. We can even do it more in detail by looking at various density grids of how, even within a country, what the population density is uh, and comparing it. And we see which parts of the world in terms of population are larger. But then we can swap that around with world military expenditure, make a different choice and see quite obvious who's spending a lot of money on the military. Or last year's election in Britain, we can look at how the constituencies voted this purely geographically by constituency or make each constituency exactly the same size or do it by population density. London, right? And the big cities. And see how the view of the island changes depending on how we look at it. So very, very lots of technical choices being made here. Or asylum in Europe. The total number of asylum applications submitted to these different countries. And here we see the countries rescaled for their population. So comparing the countries, European countries by their own populations and then shading them with how many asylum seekers they've taken. And we see that somewhat smaller countries have taken more applications than some larger countries. Very powerful. Interesting that you can mess around with your map and do all kinds of things to persuade people, right? And just summing up now, so I've just showed you a whole bunch of different maps, right? Uh, just to give you an idea of the different kind of things you can do with them and how they relate to different worldviews. And reflecting back on some ideas here from Jeremy Broughton, who's written a fantastic book called A History of the World in 12 Maps. I strongly recommend it. It's very, very readable. It tells us, you know, reflecting back, you know, maps manage the reality they try to show. Always. They must learn, we must learn to read them. And they usually work on some kind of analogy. We learn in school that a line is a road, right? That's not immediately obvious. So there's lots of other things on maps that might not be immediately obvious. You learn to read them in school, like you learn to read script. Map viewers themselves are simultaneously inside and outside the map. You're in there, aren't you? You're, you're, you're getting involved with it. If it's a map of where you are, you're moving around it. Um, and they always contain choices of inclusion and omission. So, second to last slide here. We get to replace the whole idea of the map as a representation with that as a map of a system of propositions. It's proposing something. It's not a picture, it's an argument about something, always. It's the social construction. So we are, therefore, if we're really being proper scholars here, we can't dissociate map makers from their maps. You can't look at a map and think it came from nowhere. It came very specifically from somewhere, right? And they're responsible for the conclusions you're drawing. And following and hacking, then, if you want to get more philosophical about this, and you really could, map makers are intervening into the world they're representing and changing that world as we go. So final point there, a single map then, back going back to uh, Montmagnier, a single map is but one of an indefinitely large number of maps that might be produced from the same simulate situation or from the same data. And just comparing two smartphone apps here, you can buy the A to Z one, because you have one view of the Thames, exactly the same view of the Thames uh, from your usually free iPhone or something will look like that. And why we need to know the Tesco Express Westminster there is, <laughs> you know, whatever. That's all I have to say. You know, happy for some questions here. Uh, and I'm going to make these slides available uh, with a PDF to, to Diana at the end. So thanks very much.